Welcome back to the double leg. I'm one half of the show, AJ Picks. The other half of the show, the parlay. Joining me in to break down some USC Vegas 85. Let's get into it. We're back after the weekend off, and we got some fights back at the Apex, 13 of them to be exact. Main event, Roman Delize, Nazardine, Imovov, co-main event, and Nato Moicano, Drew Dober. What do you think of the card overall? Some sneaky matchmaking. Um, you know, we're going to see a lot of guys coming off the Contender Series, a lot of prospects who are making their, you know, their sophomore debut. Uh, some good fighters. I think we're going to see some violence. And right now we got 13 fights, so let's pray for once. In our UFC watching career, we can make it to fight night with no cancellations. Yeah, because uh, I, I can't remember the last time we've had a card with thirteen fights on it. Pray for no weight misses too. It seems yeah. like every card you get some weight misses, and uh, let's just hope none none of them get canceled because of that. Because that's that's the worst. You know, the day before the fight, something falls out, and then you got to adjust some things. Uh, but I'm coming off a good card, UFC 297. We're looking to keep her going. We're gonna go through, give you. All of our uh, pr our picks and a breakdown for every single fight on the card. If you want our bets, jump in the double like premium. The link is in the description for that. Gets you every single UFC card every week uh, for thirty nine ninety nine. You get me, you get the parlay, and you get Ding and Mad Dodger in there. Jump in there and uh, join the fam, and we will cash them out. Uh, you got anything before we jump into these fights? No, oh, just. 11 fights in a, or fight weekends in a row starting now. Man, these layoffs have been killing me. I'm itching for it. I can't wait. Let's do it. Hopping in to the first fight of the night. Thomas Peterson coming in as a favorite. Jamal Pogues, slight dog. Peterson making his debut in the UFC. After his uh, win on the Contender Series, Pogues is 1-2 uh, one and two, or 1-1 one and one in the UFC. Got a win over Parisian. Just took a loss to Mick Parkin. He's getting the uh, prospect in Thomas Pearson here. Who you got? Yeah, man. This is uh this one makes me a little nervous for the Thomas Peterson betters because for one, he's coming off the contender series, making his UFC debut, and he's looked good on the regional scene. He's looked good on the contender series, but he's fighting Chandler Cole on the descent on the uh, contender series. And if you look back, Chandler Cole was like five foot ten, you know, two sixty five, and was every bit of that like short Chris Barnett almost built like. Uh, it just seemed tailor-made for a guy like Peterson to get in close, get the takedowns, ground and pound, submission, um, kind of what he does, do what he does. But Jamal Pogues, on the other hand, is not going to get much credit, in my opinion, that any time he's fighting. But when you really break it down, he's going to be the better striker than Peterson. Might, might not be as powerful, but he's going to be more technical, um, way more experienced, too. If you add up their octagon time against each other, especially at this level, I mean, Jamal Pogues has that on his in his favor. He does have a back, uh, background in wrestling himself. He's not like a standout wrestler. He's not going to go and look for takedowns on Peterson by any means, but I think he's going to be big enough and strong enough. And he's going to know what to do to an extent to where he could stuff some of the takedowns. I think he's more athletic, and I think he, uh, you know, he's got that three-round experience of going all three rounds. So you know, if Peterson comes in and struggles getting the fights to the ground, and Jamal Pogues can look out for that big overhand right, I think Pogues could start to tune him up as the fight goes on. I'm not real confident. That that'll happen. Like this is one of those heavyweight fights where sometimes you just gotta stay away. But you know, I'm not paying the the price on on Peterson here making his debut coming off of a win over Chandler Cole. So um, yeah, for the pick, I'm gonna stick with Jamal Pogues. I think if he keeps it on the feet, he's just gonna jab him to death and uh, kind of upset some people here. But definitely a greasy spot. I'm interested to, interested to see what uh, what you think about this one. Yeah, here's the thing about Jamal Pogues. The way he got in the UFC. I would say is the easy way. Okay, he was a light heavyweight, and if you're a decent light heavyweight and you pack on about 40 or 50 pounds, then you can make it into the UFC as a heavyweight because uh, there's not a lot of them, and there's not a lot of good heavyweights. So if you go on the contender series as a light heavyweight, you get a win. That's what uh, Jamal Pogues did. Goes back to the regional scene, takes a loss, then picks up a win, and then decides he's going to fight at heavyweight. And uh, two years later, Gets a win on the Contender Series as a heavyweight against a bum. Gets into the UFC, fights Josh Parisian, who's also a bum. 
gets a win in a, a very boring fight, and then gets a, a Mick Parkin, who is okay, but he's nothing great. We saw in, in Mick Parkinson's Mark Mick Parkin's last fight, he didn't look great. Like he just barely squeaked by to get a win over a, another debuting contender series guy, and he lost that fight like so easily. He landed. 20 or 36 significant strikes in a three round bout got outstruck 95 to 36 and it just looked like he had nothing for him and mick parkins is not a world beater by any means so i'm not a big jamal pokes guy but i'm also not a big thomas peterson guy because thomas peterson has little to no striking he's gonna go in there look for for uh the takedowns if he gets them he's dealing with heavyweights who aren't as skilled uh, and he's a big dude. So if he gets on top of you, you're probably not getting up. I did show a good submission his last time out on the contender series. But other than that, it's just a lot of ground and pound finishes. Like these guys that don't know how to get up or Thomas Peterson's just so dang big and strong on top that they can't and they end up wilting. So I don't really like either of these guys. I do think uh, Thomas Peterson might have more of an upside considering he does get you to the ground. He can finish you there. I don't think Jamal Pogues has much of a one-shot knockout power on the feet. Um, and I just don't really see much of a, a pace that he sets. Like, he kind of just stands there, throws a jab, just throws a jab, throws a jab. There's no one-one-two. There's no combination. It's just a lot of jabs. And in this one, I think Thomas Peterson probably gets some takedowns, maybe wins a decision. I honestly think Jamal Pogues is a, a type of fighter that, is going to do everything he can to not get finished. Uh, so I think Thomas Peterson will do enough over three rounds to get the win, if not get a, a win inside the distance. But again, this is just low-level heavyweights that you probably don't want to get too invested on either side because a lot of weird stuff can happen. Thomas Peterson will be the pick for me, but I'm not too uh, thrilled about either side. <laughs> I just realized Thomas is, uh, Thomas Peterson's nickname is Thomas the Train. <laughs> Thomas the train. <laughs> and he has a knockout loss to Waldo, Waldo Cortez Acosta in the third round, which yeah. kind of shows you. I mean, the guy's never really been past um, the, you know, he's never won a fight that's gone past a round and a half. He's, yeah. he's always finishing a first round or early in the second. And when it did go to the third round against Cortez Acosta, he's just gassed. He's getting touched up by the volume. I guess if Pogues wins, um, I, I think it's, that's how it's got to go. It's got to go past the second. Yeah, I, I think I look back at the Parisian Pogues fight and Parisian was getting like anybody could take t Josh Parisian down. He's got 46 percent takedown defense and Parisian's not some great striker, but like Pogues had to go to the wrestling. So he had five takedowns against True. him. So I'm like, what does this guy have to offer? I just haven't really seen much at all. Uh, and I don't I think Thomas Peterson's wrestling is is good enough to get a win here. That's why I'll take him for the pick, but this is just a greasy one to start out the night. You got to stay so, away, betting. Yeah, you might want to stay away or uh, look for some kind of prop there. Yeah. Uh, Markel Madero's coming in as the favorite against Landon Quinones, slight underdog. And uh, Quinones made his debut against, uh, God, what's his name? Nazrat Hackers. Uh, I was thinking about something. Completely different, but Nazrat has Hack Perez. A good fight, landed 148 significant strikes. Uh, we saw him on the the tough series, the most recent tough series. Madero's coming off the contender series, a knockout win in the first round via knee against Isa Isakov in a fight where I believe he was a, a slight dog in that one. Um, but either way, picking up a, a win and getting the shot in the UFC. Who you got in this one? He has another greasy one, like from a betting standpoint. Like I don't know if you, if I'd be willing to to buy in on Madero's making his debut off the contender series. You know, when all you saw was a quick first round knee fights over. Like you didn't really get to see him, you know, spread out his game plan or what he has to offer in mixed martial arts at this level. Like at, at all, the fight was over real quick. Uh, I do look at his record though, and you watch some of his fights. He's not fighting the best opponents outside of the UFC. Like he's fighting in some good promotions. But, um, you know, his second or his fight before the contender series was Justice Lamperez, who's eight and eight professionally. He's not fighting the high level guys. He does look good against them. And he's not like a he's a very composed striker where he's not rushing things and making many mistakes in that aspect. 
Um, you know, he, he's a strong guy. He's athletic. Seems like he's durable and, um, you know, has a good gas tank. But again, he's just not really faced adversity to where you can really tell how well it's going to hold up when you got a guy in your face throwing good shots back at you and when you're getting touched up a little bit, mm-hmm. which is exactly what Landon Quinones is going to do. Like we saw it against Hack Grass. He looked good in the first. Um, you know, he slowed down after uh, the second round, but, you know, he took that fight on short notice for his UFC debut against a guy in Hack Grass who had like 10 fights in the UFC already. Like the level of competition these guys have been fighting is miles and miles apart. You know, Nez went from uh, the ultimate fighter to fighting hack brass, um, you know, landed 148 significant strikes on hack brass. That's pretty damn good when you're talking about, uh, you know, a hack press who's a very slick boxer. Uh, so that, that impressed me in that fight. Yeah. Uh, I'll be interested to see now that he's got, you know, more of a, a full camp coming into a fight against a UFC debut or Medeiros. Um, you know, I'm going to take another underdog here. I think Medeiros could look really good early. I could see him, you know, we see it a lot with these debuters, maybe starting to to slow down as the fight goes on. And when you get a big volume and, and pace guy like Quinones, who does hold some power in his hands as well, uh, more often than not, that's the guy that I like to be be sided with. So I'm going to take Quinones here as the dog. I'm, I'm with you. I think, uh, you know, Quinones' only losses in his career are Muhammad Naimov, who was a, a killer at, at 145. Uh, and I mean, he's undefeated in the UFC. That was yeah. back in 2019. It was a split decision. And then the loss to Nazareth Hackbrass. So I think the guy is definitely good enough to be a playable underdog here. Uh, and Madero's making his debut. We see it time and time again. Guys that come off the contender series come into the UFC. And it's just a different level of competition. Uh, and the guy that he beat on the contender series, Issa Isakov, was a, he's a 34 year old. Like if he was any good, he probably would have, you know, gotten a shot a little bit earlier than when he was 34 years old. So I like Medeiros. I like his style, uh, but I think the value's on the dog here with Quinones, and uh, I'll take him for the pick as well. The one thing, too, on the Medeiros' side that I wish I could look into a little bit more is, dude, he's got so many canceled bouts. It makes me wonder about injuries and weight cuts and everything. It's like, Every fight he wins or loses, he's got another one scheduled, gets cut. I mean, he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cancellations in his pretty short uh, MMA career so far. He's got nine fights and eight cancellations. That tells me either, I guess, people are scared to fight him or he's got injuries he deals with or and he doesn't cut weight well either. So it's interesting. Very interesting. Maybe uh, people are just pulling out so they don't want to fight him. <laughs> Maybe he's just that good. But <laughs> We'll move on to the featherweight bout. Jung Yang Lee coming in as a favorite uh, against Blake Builder and the, another slight underdog. Builder, 33 years old. Uh, he is now 1-1 one one in the UFC. Coming off the loss to uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Kyle Nelson. That was his first professional loss. We'll see how he bounces back here. He's coming in as the dog. You think he gets it done, or is the South Korean going to get another win? I think it's a dog card, man. I like uh, from just the, you know, a standpoint of, I guess, if you like these models and, and stuff like that, and you really look at statistics and everything, Blake Builder is a perfect buy low spot. He, he lost his last UFC fight against Kyle Nelson, one that people didn't really see coming. Um, you know, it's his only loss in his professional career. And, you know, you buy him low there because he, he, I don't think he fought to his potential. Um, Kyle Nelson's probably a little better and tougher than people give credit for. I mean, there's a significant reach advantage, disadvantage for him. And uh, he was definitely the smaller guy in that fight. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like he's due for a bounce back here against Jung Young Lee, who you know has some experience in the road to the UFC and has fought some guys there that you've probably never heard of and probably can't pronounce their names. But, uh, you know, the split decision he won against um, Za in his last fight was pretty damn close. And, you know, Zaw just implemented his game plan and put him up against the cage and held on for dear life. But, um, you know, we didn't really see what happens when Jung Young Lee takes shots or when he's getting his leg kicked off. And that's exactly what Blake Builder is going to come out and do. And if you want to go to the grappling with Blake Builder, I mean, kind of be his guest. He's pretty damn good in that aspect of mixed martial arts. He's got some good submissions. Um, I mean, that's where he wins most of his fights. So, yeah, I just think this is a great bounce back spot for Blake Builder. And if you're going to give me plus... 120 on him i think it's dog or pass here haven't seen enough enough out of lee to be real confident in him but i think blake builder is a good mixed martial artist he just had a a bad fight in his last one and he's going to bounce back strong here 
Yeah, I'm with you here, here too, because I watched the, the Jung Young Lee fight, and he was like a minus 250 favorite. Ija uh, just pretty much took him down a lot of these, or a lot of these, uh, on a lot of his attempts. Like, there wasn't much action on the feet. I would love to see Blake Builder go for the takedowns. He hasn't really yeah. you know, gone to that a lot in his UFC career, um, but that is a path that I think he could exploit. And on the feet, he's a good enough uh, stand-up fighter. I think his boxing is sharp. Could smash some leg kicks, uh, get the 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 leg damage, and maybe then shoot a takedown. Look for some work there. I think it, this is just a, a guy that's – it's technically his debut because it was a road to the UFC fight, yeah. so it wasn't against a real UFC-level uh, guy. Ija is not a terrible fighter, um, but I do think Blake Builder – some value on there as a dog. I'll take him for the pick as well. And uh, I'm just hoping he, he shoots some takedowns. Cause yeah. if he goes in there and just, you know, has a boxing match like he did against Kyle Nelson. And that, that Kyle Nelson fight was just so frustrating to watch because he just wasn't really throwing much. Like it, there was opportunities where he could go and Kyle Nelson just wasn't able to, or, Kyle, or Blake Builder wasn't able to like land on him. Like Kyle Nelson mm-hmm. is a big 145er, but I thought Blake Builder would be able to get inside a little bit more. And uh, I don't know, it was just very disappointing, but I think this is a decent bounce back spot for him at plus 110. I'll take him. We move on to the welterweight bout. Temba Garimbo coming in as minus 240 favorite against Pete Rodriguez, sitting at plus 200. The man, the myth, the legend, Pete Rodriguez. Is he going to make weight? If there's one <laughs> thing you got to look at here, is he going to make weight? Because he used to fight, or he wanted to fight at 155. Uh, and that was just a failed operation because he's not really, doesn't have the frame for 170. I mean, he's 5'9", doesn't have the longest reach. It's not like he's a grappler. I mean, he's a, he's a striker. And uh, he wanted to fight at 155, tried that twice, couldn't do it. So I guess he's going up to 170. Should be able to make 170. Uh, let's let's hope. But Timber Garimbo, uh, you see the frame there, six one. He's long. He likes to take the fight to the ground. Showed that in a, in a lot of his or two of his his UFC fights. Goes for some takedowns early on the feet. He's got some decent striking, and he's a big favorite in this one. Do you think he gets it done? Timber's got to go to the to the wrestling right away, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, Pete Rodriguez is dangerous when you you know you get into that boxing range with him. And he can close the distance, and, and he's you know he's a very explosive fighter. Uh, and if he can get inside, like the guy has a ton of power. He doesn't make it out of the first round very often, win or lose. Um, so again, I, I think for Timba, if you get to him with the wrestling early, you slow him down, make him fight off of his back, make him work back to his feet. Um, I think he's going to be very very well off going into that second and third round because Timba's like got some some decent striking from the outside, but he's not like a real polished striker yet, and um, he's not the most powerful guy. He doesn't have the heaviest hands where he's going to put you out. But, I mean, if he messes around with Pete Rodriguez long enough on the feet, he could be on the receiving end of one of those big shots. And, um, you know, Pete Rodriguez does have the, the power to put anybody out. So that's the one thing that would make me nervous if you're betting on Timba Garimbo here is that he does get clipped in the first round just messing around w- with the striking. But, uh, you know, if he's if he has a good game plan, which I expect him to, he's got good coaches, he trains with good people, um, I think he just goes right to the to the clinch, puts him up against the cage, looks for the takedowns, and works from there. And then I'd be way more confident as the fight goes on. So yeah, I, I'm taking Timba Garimbo here. Um, but you know, if Rodriguez has any chance to win this fight, it's it's by knockout. There's no way he wins a decision, in my opinion, with Garimbo. So if you are betting on Pete Rodriguez, I mean, just take his KO prop if if, if they're going to give you a decent number. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, not too confident in in uh, him here. So yeah, Garimbo's the pick for me, but probably not going to have him in too many parlays. I just haven't seen um, enough that I like out of him to be confident to lay my money on him. Yeah, the bright side on Pete Rodriguez, it's only a career loss, professional career loss, is to Jack Della Maddalena. <laughs> the wins are the bums. And he does yeah. have a UFC win, but it was to Mike Jackson. So take that with a grain of salt. Uh, if you don't know who Mike Jackson is, he's not really a fighter. Uh, he, P. Rodriguez was a minus 700 favorite against some first round knockout. It was a nice performance. Well, Mike Jackson is like what a photographer who yeah. had a side hobby. I don't really know how he got in the UFC, but 
that's a totally different story. On the Temba Garimbo side, I know it's a pretty chalky favorite uh, for a guy that we haven't really seen too much in the UFC, but I mean, if you haven't heard, like the la- his last after his last win, his life kind of completely changed because uh, he, he let out the story about how much how he had like nine dollars in his bank account or something like that. Mm-hmm. Kind of blew up. Uh, he was living in the the MMA Masters on the couch or whatever. He didn't really have like a home. And then The Rock buys him a house. He's got a, a true home now. He's been at MMA, MMA Masters for a good amount of time. And uh, you got to assume with all that that has happened, he's just going to get better you know, with the financial side. He doesn't have to worry about that. He can go to to uh, train every day, get better, working with a good team. So I like the the Temba Garimbo side in this fight. Uh, it is a favorite, but I do think he gets it done. I think he's a little bit more well-rounded. And the the willingness that he's shown in his past two fights to go to the ground gives me more confidence in him here. Yeah, I'll definitely take him for the pick. Uh, flyway about Charles Johnson coming in at plus 170 against Azat Maxim. Sitting as the minus 200 favorite, the undefeated Azat Maxim. Is he going to get his O snatched by Charles Johnson or not? What do you think? Man, I- I've made some bad plays on Charles Johnson recently. One being in the Ode Osborne fight, which, you know, split decision. Charles Johnson outlanded him, and, you know, it was a very close fight. They just both slowed down. Took him against Estevam, and I started to realize in that fight, Charles Johnson needs five rounders to win. <laughs> like he, yeah. he just the way he beats guys is just outlasting him and putting the volume on starting in the third round. Like if he had rounds four and five, he wins against Rafael Estevam probably by finish just from Estevam being completely gassed. Uh, that's like the one thing with Charles Johnson is if you're fighting, if he's fighting a guy who gasses out, I like his chances. I didn't really see that uh, with Maxim in his debut. Uh, I thought on the feet. You know, he's got a little bit of power. He kind of stumbled. Um, oh, I keep wanting to say Andre Feely. Tyson Nam, uh, in, in his debut, he landed some really good shots. Uh, landed a few takedowns, too. Uh, but overall, like, Maxim isn't a guy that I'd be real confident with betting on in this fight at this price. He probably beats Charles Johnson, don't get me wrong. Uh, but he's got to go in and he's got to wrestle because obviously that's Charles Johnson's weakness. I mean, the guy was taken down 11 times in one fight by Cody Durden. Uh, you know, he's just a guy that's always on his back for the first two rounds. And if you can do that against him and just survive in the third, you're going to win. Charles Johnson, not the most power. He's not finishing people besides the great Jimmy Flick. Uh, other than that, you know, it, it's he's just all volume, not much power at all. And uh, a guy like Azat Maxim, if he can just win the first two, man, I think he walks away pretty easily here. 29-28, I think he could even win the third. So, yeah, give me Azat here. Yeah, I mean, if he comes in here and – decides to have a striking battle with Charles Don- Johnson, he'd be a complete idiot because the writing's on the wall. If you want to beat yeah. Charles Johnson, throw him up against the cage, get some takedowns, bank a couple rounds, survive the last one, and it's game over. Uh, but if he goes in there and, and decides to uh, to strike with Charles Johnson, it's not like Charles Johnson is some amazing striker, but he's definitely capable on the feet to get a win here. Uh, and the volume th- and the pace that he can push is one of the best for 125. Like there's certain guys that you don't want to go into deep waters with. Charles Johnson still never been finished. Uh <laughs> and and he's gone up against some good guys like Cody Durden, yeah. Mom Kaya, uh, and, and didn't get finished in, in any of those. So and even Estevam. Estevam's pretty solid. Uh and he weathered the first two rounds and damn near got a 10-8 in the third round. So if Maxim goes in there and grapples him, then uh, I think he should be able to get a win here uh, just based on the fact that Charles Johnson is pretty easy to take down, but he's he's hard to keep down. Yeah. So if you, that's part of his like strategy. So like, I'll get taken down, but I'll get back up, and eventually they're going to wear down from all these takedowns, and then I can start to take over. In a three-round fight, it doesn't always work out. So Maxim will be the pick for me. I wasn't super impressed with his fight with Tyson Nam. Uh, Cause he got outstruck and he only landed two takedowns. So it's a little sketchy to take him uh, at minus 200, but he'll be the pick for me. Nonetheless, that's, that's the thing. Like Charles Johnson against Estevam. I don't think people, like I made that pick and people call me an idiot after he lost, but he outlanded Estevam 72 to 18 on significant strikes. Like yeah. most of those coming in the third round. 
it's just the takedowns, man. But uh, you know, if Charles if he can stuff the takedowns, like he's gonna be in the fight. And that's the scary thing about it. But um, you know, the, the the stat that really jumps off the page and makes me chuckle is that Charles Johnson has six UFC fights and he's been taken down thirty one times. That's, <laughs> that's crazy. Insane. You know, that's over three three times a fight. Um, so yeah, everything should should point to Azat Maxim, but you just never know some of these guys' fight IQ at this level. Yeah, at least that shows you if he gets taken down, he can get back up. You yeah, know, yeah, the yeah, round's not over. That's true. So, yeah, uh, Maxim, you better come with a gas tank, otherwise it's going to be a, a long night for you. Strawweight bout Molly McCann back in action, and just the matchup that we ordered. The rematch. She's coming in as a favorite against Deanna Belbita. Uh, Molly McCann got the win in the first fight. That was ages ago. To be exact, that was 2019, so about three and a half years ago. Uh, and obviously, M Molly McCann coming down to 115 after that brutal performance against Julia Stolyarenko. The co-main event uh, at the UFC London card. A fight that seemed like she was set up to win. And then goes in there and gets armbarred against the armbar queen, Yulia Stolyarenko, who we will talk about later. But Diana Balbita, looking to spoil the show, looking to get some revenge. Do you think she gets it done? Dude, I don't, I don't like this for Molly McCann. We kind of talked before this. Um, I, I think she's been a little overhyped in her UFC career. I mean, it's been a roller coaster up and downs. I think she got attached to Patty Pimblett in the spotlight, and the UFC liked that story. They liked the image, and they pushed her. And, you know, when she ran into Aaron Blanchfield, she was taken down and submitted by Kimura after being in um, the crucifix, just getting her elbow or her head elbowed into, you know, into oblivion. She just did not look good at all at that level. J Stoli Aranko, man, we're, we're going to talk about her in a bit, like you said, but she has a lot of losses in the UFC. I believe going into that Molly McCann fight, she was one and four in her last five. And <laughs> Molly McCann just gave her the arm. She rolled into it. She was up against the cage. She wouldn't have been submitted from there. Stoliarenko wouldn't have been able to extend her arm, and, and she rolled right into it. I, I don't think the fight IQ is great for Molly. I think she's going to come out here and swing and bang, look for some spinning elbows, maybe try to wrestle a little bit like she did in the first fight between these two. Uh, but this fight, you know, you look at the, the, uh, the their first fight, there's so much more to it now. That was Belbita's debut. Yeah, it was her debut in that fight. She's 22 or 23 years old. Um, you know, Molly was in her prime at that time at 28 or 29. The tables have kind of turned. Molly's 34, 35. She's getting older. Belbita's now 28 or 29, right in her prime. Um, so, you know, Molly moving down a weight class is kind of a red flag for me. It's a little concerning uh, that, that why she's wanting to make this, this move down. I, I really don't know. Diana's going to be comfortable in her own weight class. Diana also has a very high pace and volume that she sets she's always throwing something good kicks up the middle uh and, you know her, her grappling looks like it's improved as well in her fight against i think it was uh Oliveira, you know she got a take down there she showed in a few more fights where she can get the fights to the ground she, i mean she took down carolina kowakiewicz Kow yeah. kowakiewicz uh which was impressive to me and she landed nearly 100 significant strikes so that's a higher level of competition i think she is getting better i think this is going to be a whole different fight it might be Molly in the first round, but cutting down to 115 with the gas tank and the volume and pace that Diana is going to set here, uh, I'm going to take the underdog at plus 220 or plus yeah plus 220. I, I really like that line against a girl in McCann who's kind of struggling. Yeah, this is a this is one for Molly McCann where she needs it badly. Like she's in a spot where if she doesn't get a win here, it's looking really bad for her because she's making the move down in weight. Cross your fingers that she makes the weight uh, because at 125, she's severely undersized. She kind of relies on her, her power and just kind of her grit. Going down to 115, you think you're going to have an edge with uh, the power and you're going to have a little bit more physicality with these 115ers, but Diana Belvita is going to have a six-inch reach advantage, three inches in height for uh, advantage for Belvita, so she's not really a small 115er. And... Uh, yeah, I just think Del Deanna Belbita is kind of the value side in this one. Like, who's going to lay minus 275 <laughs> on Molly McCann after we what we just watched? Like, Stolyarenko isn't a world beater. Yeah. And McCann, 
she got her hype from beating up kind of cans. Like, yeah. I mean, you're knocking out – like, Luana Carolina isn't terrible, uh, but that was kind of a fight until she knocked her out in the third round. Like, she had a great first round. Second round, Carolina's coming back into it, and then third round, she hits her with the spinning back elbow. What are the odds she's going to land three spinning back elbows in the UFC? I don't – probably pretty damn low. And before that, she goes to a decision with Gian Kim. Like Gian Kim's not good. Uh, and then she, and then after the Carolina fight, she knocks out Hannah Goldie. Hannah Goldie's not good. So, right. I don't. She's not. Doesn't have like great wins. And uh, Belbita, not doesn't have great wins either. But she's still going to be fighting at her normal weight class, uh, and she can put up a good amount of volume. So this fight goes three rounds, and Diana Belbita outstrikes her by 10 or 15 significant strikes every round, then I like her chances. And with Molly McCann, she has good offensive grappling, or good offensive wrestling, I should say. It's not really grappling. She she can land some takedowns offensively, but defensively, she's got terrible takedown defense. And if Balbita could take her down, then uh, she could be in a good spot to even, you know, if the fight plays out on the feet, last minute of the round, Go for a takedown and get it. Secure that round. So I think Bell beat at plus 220 is the side for me. I'll take the dog. If, you, if you're betting Molly McCann at minus 275, good luck to you. Uh, but I wouldn't want to be you. That's, uh, that's what I got on that one. Yeah. Last thing I'll say, too, that I forgot to touch on is, you know, Diane is three inches taller here. She's got six-inch reach advantage in this fight as well and obviously had it in the first fight. But she's got more experience now. I feel like she's going to know how to use that reach advantage a little more. She's going to learn from the last fight, like what she did wrong, what, what got her in the bad situations. And I think that, yeah, like you said, that Belbita is the value side. I think she's got way more upside. Uh, she had more room to grow and learn from her last fight since the last time these two met. And Molly, Molly hasn't really changed. Like her game plan is always the same. You know, I, I just, I feel a big upset coming here and I'm going to be on the Belbita side. It's a no brainer for me. I hope it hits so bad. Last thing I hear. Balbita was a plus 130 underdog against Carolina Kovacavich. Granted, she definitely lost that fight, pretty easily lost that fight, but Carol, I would take Carolina Kovacavich at like minus 200 against Molly McCann. Oh, all day long. Like all fucking day. Like, <laughs> Carolina is a very solid 115er, and uh, Balbita was only a plus 130 dog. So I'll take the dog, and so are you, and uh, I'm sure we'll probably have a bet on it. Oh, yeah. Uh, flyway bout Luana Carolina coming in as the very slight underdog against Yulia Stolyarenko. We just talked about her, uh, and this will be her second fight at 125. I was shocked that she could really make 125, and she looked damn good. Uh, I mean, first round armbar against Molly McCann. We just talked about it, uh, and Luana, Luana Carolina was a victim of Molly McCann, and since then, she took a loss to Joanne Wood. And then took a win against Ivana Petrovich her last time out, where she was a plus 200, around plus 180, plus 200 dog. And that was the double leg pick of the week, the free pick of the week. Last time uh, Carolina fought was her money line plus 200, and it cashed. Are we going to take her this week or not? I think it's time to hop off, um, but not maybe not even hop off and, and pick Stoli Renko. I just. I'm having a hard time getting a good read on this fight because at first I thought if Stoli Renko gets the fight to the ground, she's going to find the sub and she's going to get it done. But I watched, you know, Carolina's last fight against uh, Petrovic. She, she looked pretty good on the ground. Like she looked very good in the scramble. She knew where she needed to be uh, positional wise. And I, I was kind of impressed. And if the fight stays on the feet, I think Stoli Renko's obviously got the power, but the, the kickboxing and the volume and accuracy is going to be with uh, Luana here. Like she's going to, in my opinion, pick her apart, you know, from maybe not with the most power or any damaging shots, but she's going to land the more volume for sure. Oh, yeah. But Stoli Renko is just kind of this warrior that's just going to march forward. Uh, you know, you watch some of her interviews. She she seems like a badass. She seems like she wants it. She's always working hard. She's just a tough out for anybody. Like, she's lost some fights, but at the same time, like, she doesn't go away easy. Um, she is probably the more dangerous fighter for sure out of these two. And in women's MMA, like, I... I have a thing where if I'm going to pick and bet on a woman um, between, you know, Luana Carolina and Stoli Renko, I think you have to take the one that's more dangerous and who has the finishing ability, which is definitely 
Stoli Renko, in my opinion. All it takes for her is one takedown, or even if she pulled guard, like she's so dangerous off her back with the arm bars and everything. She's got like a, a ridiculous amount of arm bar wins. So, um, yeah, it, it's very, very hard for me to choose this fight. Early in the week, I was on Luana after watching more tape and, and seeing Stoli Renko kind of riding this high off of beating McCann like that first round sub. Like, I have to take the girl who's got the, the more finishing upside here. Yeah. It's uh, to be exact on uh, Stoli Aranko. 11 wins, 10 submissions, all arm bars. <laughs> so if Luana Carolina hasn't been drilling her arm bar defense, she would be a complete idiot. Uh, but this, this is a really clear fight as far as styles go. Like Stoli Aranko wants to get you to the ground. Luana mm -hmm. Carolina wants to stand and strike with you. So it's going to come down to who can impl implement their game plan the most, and I would probably bank on Stuli Aranko getting the takedowns at the apex in the smaller cage. I think the move down to 125 is really good for her because at 135 and sometimes at 140, she was fighting at these just big girls at 135, 140 that her size and her style just didn't really work well for her there. I think at 125 it works a lot well, a lot more well. Uh, Carolina, she's got 73% takedown defense. Um, and then you just look at like who's taking her down. Like she got taken out twice by Joanne Wood. Joanne Wood's not a very good wrestler. Molly McCann took her down twice. I did say she had good offensive wrestling, but still Molly McCann. And then uh, twice against Ivana Petrovich. And Petrovich was this like sort of hyped up prospect coming into the ufc that's why she was the favorite uh but if you watch the tape it was just really not anything crazy petrovich still took her down twice uh it was a 29 28 win for carolina she dropped the second round i think stoli Aranko is going to be heavier on top i think the the submission ability is just much more dangerous i think stoli Aranko gets a win here uh i mean I'd probably be crazy to say by decision because she's got one decision victory. <laughs> so if she gets her to the ground, she's probably putting her out. And uh, I like the upside there. Like you said, the upside of the finishing ability there for Stoli Ranko looks good to me. I'll take her for the pick. And we will move on to another women's fight. Another flyweight bout, Viviani Aruja, Arajo. I don't know if I could say it. Uh, against Natalia Silva, who is a pretty sizable favorite. And we all know Natalia Silva. It's kind of been the uh, next hyped up thing in the flyweight division. She's getting a, a ranked opponent here in Viviani. She's coming off a big win as an underdog against uh, Jennifer Maya. I think she can keep that going as a bigger underdog against Natalia Silva. I don't know, man. I think this is where the, the road ends, if I'm being honest. like Natalia Silva has shown um something a very unique to women's mma and that's just the ko ability like this girl is so lethal with her striking it's insane like she's so fun to watch um you know and if she doesn't put you out she showed in her last fight against andrea lee you know she can be there for all three rounds she's not just this first round second round or bust i mean she has she she finished Teresa bleda in, in the third round in their fight um so yeah i i think arujao is a good fighter. She's a good dog to take in some of these lower level, you know, fights. But she is, let's see, she's like what, 38 now? 37 or 38? Like she's getting up there in age. And now she's getting fed to a young killer in Natalia Silva, who's red hot right now. She's got a lot of momentum. She's got that style where uh, you know, on the feet, she's gonna absolutely drain you from eating those power shots the whole fight. You know, Viviani loses to Amanda Hebos, Alexa Grasso, like she's fighting the the higher level competition for sure um but natalia silva just seems like she's next up and at this point it's like aruja is kind of this gatekeeper fighting these girls like grasso when they're on their way up rivas um you know she beat jennifer maya upset her there but you know jennifer maya outlanded her she had double the significant strikes in that fight um you know it's not like she blew her out of the water and, and looked phenomenal yeah. by any means so i just think against natalia silva if Arujao can't get the takedowns, and she's forced to stand and strike with her. It's not going to be good. She's got a negative striking differential. She gets hit way more than she lands. Um, yeah, so I, I just think Silva, she's just next up, man. She's uh, a very solid striker, but
but for women's MMA, she holds a hell of a lot of power too. And we'll see if Rujao can take it. Yeah, she's she's just like you don't see the type of explosive athlete like that in women's MMA all that time or all all the time. So it's like Natalia Silva, you see the seal or the ceiling is super high. So I can understand why this line is minus three forty five. And then uh, you think, you know, women's MMA. What could go wrong? You're <laughs> minus 345 on a women's MMA fight. But to be fair, Natalia Silva as a favorite has looked pretty dang good. I mean, minus 165 against Teresa Blada. Third round knockout. Uh, minus 1,000 against Victoria Leonardo. And she put that, she put Victoria Leonardo through hell for th- under three yeah. minutes. First round knockout. It was disgusting. Uh, and then uh, minus 320 against Andrea Lee, pretty easy, 30-27 there. So Viviani being 37 years old, uh, it's not looking good for her. And honestly, I look like I look at Natalia Silva kind of similar to Amanda Hebos style. Like she's got some, some flashy striking, a uh, good ground game. But I think Natalia Silva is like a little bit better than Amanda Hebos uh, yeah. and not as hittable. That is the, right. the big thing. It's like Amanda Hebos pretty hittable and you look at natalia silva uh she absorbs 2.23 significant strikes per minute lands 5.2 so she's hitting people and she's not getting hit and uh if viviani is going to go to the the ground game try to look for the grappling like she's getting against uh jennifer maya natalia silva in her debut fought jasmine jazz davisius who has a really good ground game really good takedown game and uh she didn't take down natalia silva a single time so I would expect, and she fought Teresa Blada, who's also a very good offensive wrestler and only took her down once. She's got a 92% takedown defense. So I think Natalia Silva gets a win here. Women's MMA chalk, you don't love it. Uh, might want to look for some type of problem, whether it's decision or maybe she even finds a knockout. But in Viviani's career, she's only been finished once by knockout. That's in 17 fights. This is women's MMA, so you probably don't want to get too crazy on those knockout props. So I'll take Natalia Silva for the pick, and uh, I think she she gets another win here. Welterweight, Bal Gilbert Urbina coming as the minus 200 favorite against Charles Radke, the man, the myth, the legend, with the post-fight speech. <laughs> coming in at plus 170, who are you taking in this one? <laughs> Radke's so lucky that Vanell Cop, who has a way bigger name than him, dropped the same word to take the heat off him in that fight or not on that fight card. Um, but you know, this is another fight where I, I'm not going to be shocked if the underdog pulls it off here. Like Urbina, I think people are high on him, and it's like the opposite of the the buy low. This is almost like a sell high for me on Urbina. He comes out in his last fight as a near pick him, I believe, maybe just slight favorite, and it was one. Of, it was another one of our plays of the week, um, and. He beats Orion Kosi, who was injured, come to find out. Like, you watch some of his interviews. He was not confident going into that fight. I remember um, I actually interviewed Kosi, uh, his fight before that, and he talked about all these injuries he had. And I remember fight week in the media day, he was still talking about him. Like, he shouldn't, you know, he, he almost pulled out of this fight. And he goes in there, and he gets beat up in the first round and then takes the body shot in the second, gets dropped, fights over. That's all she wrote. But, like, Urbina... Going from Ryan Kosi um, to being a big favorite here against Radke. I mean, Radke's not anywhere the level of Kosi. Like, he's levels above that, in my opinion. He's a smart fighter. He went in there against Blood Diamond in enemy territory and just suffocated Blood Diamond. He didn't give him any chance to use his offense. Put him against the cage. Yeah, it might have been boring, uh, but he's very effective with it. And even at space, like, he beat Blood Diamond at his own game with the striking, too. Had Blood Diamond wobbled. He had him tired. He did everything right and everything he needed to, um, to to get that win. Like he didn't really chase the finish too hard and gas himself out. I, I just liked a lot of things I saw out of him there, regardless of who it was. You know, Blood Diamond has some losses in the UFC, hasn't looked good at all. But um, you know, Urbina doesn't have the most experience either. Like he's definitely in his last three fights have fought better competition. Has the loss to Brian Battle where he got submitted in the second round. That's a little bit of a red flag against uh, Radke for me here. He gets flatlined by, I don't even remember if it was flatlined, but knocked out by Treshawn Gore. Um, and, you know, in the Gore fight, Gore definitely has some power in his hands. And, uh, you know, similar to to Radke, not the sharpest striker in the world, but he swings hard with that left hand. And if he connects, he can put your lights out. 
Ryan Battle, a good all-around fighter, has some good grappling, and I think Radke is kind of in that similar realm uh, of grappling strength and able to get fights where he wants it to. I mean, if Battle was doing that to on the ground to uh, to Radke or sorry to Urbina, like I, I could see Radke coming in here, coming straight across and implementing that game plan as well here. Urbina is like a taller guy; he's thin, um, good striker, and you know, if Radke can just weather that storm early, I think his style is one that's going to drain the gas tank a little bit here. So I'm not going to be taking Urbina this time around. Probably going to take a shot on the dog here. I've already got one small bet locked in on him. Um, I don't know if I'm I'm confident enough to raise it over one unit, but I, I just like Radke's style against an Urbina who might be getting a little overhyped here. I mean, he's one and two in his last three, and that wins over Ryan Kosey. So I don't know. Yeah, the thing about these guys, they're both coming off wins. Against guys who are just straight right. trash. So right. I don't really know where to value them. Like Urbina bounced from welterweight to middleweight. I'm assuming he went on the, the ultimate fighter at middleweight because that was the weight class that they were doing. And that's kind of an opportunity you take. He fights Brian Battle for the, the tournament championship. Loses, then takes a... Uh, Almost two years off, comes back at welterweight against uh, Orion Kosi. Anybody's going to be Kosi pretty much if you have a, a pulse. Um, so, or unless you're not Blood Diamond, because I think that's his <laughs> only UFC win is against Blood Diamond. Yeah. So then you look at Charles Radke and he gets a win over Blood Diamond. It's like, what do you really do with that? Then you look at like the rest of his career, he's not fighting like straight bums. Um, he got a win over that Raheem Forrest who fought in the contender series. His losses before that are to some decent guys. Austin Hubbard being one of them back in 2018, who was in the UFC, uh, but is not very good either. So, I mean, it really, I, th I think the value comes down to the dog in this one. It's like, I'd probably go dog or pass. I wouldn't lay minus 200 on Urbina. I don't think he's that much better than Charles Radke. Uh, and Radke does have some pop in his shots. It's really sloppy striking. And then he'll look for the takedowns, look to control you up against the cage. Urbina against Kosi was kind of like more active on the feet, kind of wore him down, get some takedowns, uh, threatened a submission, and ultimately got him out of there after he wore him down in round two. So I would probably take Charles Radke for the pick. Uh, I'd say I'd chalk it up to a dogger pass. I think the line has moved a lot in Arbina's favor. And I think it's kind of just past the point of no return. Like if you got him early, like that's a solid, I think he's, he opened it like minus 160 or something, minus 150, somewhere around there. And it kind of steamed up towards him. So at this point, I'm like not really interested in taking it. So for the pick, I'll take Charles Radke. Maybe we get there from a betting standpoint, but he'll be the pick for me. Middleweight bout Mahmoud Muradov sitting at plus 150 against Ali Askab Hizriv sitting at minus 180. The undefeated Dagestani taking on Mahmoud, both men 33 years of age. You see the height difference there and uh, not much of a reach difference, but undefeated Daggy. You know what he's going to do. You see the beard. You see no mustache. <laughs> you see he's a Dagestani. You know what he wants to do. Mahmoud Muradov probably knows what he wants to do as well. So comes down to can can uh, Kizrev get the takedowns? What do you think? Do you think he does it or not? Oh, man. It, it's another one of those spots that makes me a little bit nervous taking him at this price. Like, I wish this was more of like an evenly matched or an evenly lined fight, like, uh, you know, minus 120 plus 105 or something. I don't know. And I'd be a little more confident in taking him. It's just a little chalky right now for me for him coming off of a win to on his debut to Dennis Tolulin. Like Tolulin's kind of been beaten up by everybody. Uh, he did look good in the fight though. He showed not only the grappling and wrestling skill set, but he showed how heavy handed he is um, on the feet as well. He, he's a southpaw. He his boxing looked pretty good to me against Tolulin. Like Tolulin is not a great fighter, but if he is one thing, like he's a good boxer for for MMA. He's got good MMA boxing. He just doesn't take the shots well, and he doesn't grapple well. But uh, Kisriev, man, if he gets the takedowns in this fight against Murdov early, I think he sets himself up for a lot more success in this because Murdov's a dude that walks around. You know, he's a big guy. He's got a lot of muscle. And as fights go on, uh, you know, he's 
a little slows down just a little bit. I mean, Kyle Barallo kind of exposed that a bit uh, when he was able to take him down and, and just wear on him with his with his takedown in that fight. Uh, you know, Mearshart took him down three times and submitted him. And then against Brian Barberina, I was on the Muradov finish prop, and he just could not do it. And as the fight went on, you could just tell he's getting a little more tired, a little more tired. And, uh, you know, he started shooting takedowns of himself and taking taking Barberina down and just never could pull it off. If Kizreyev comes in um, and stands and strikes with Muradov, you know, the, the size difference and the reach difference um, is going to be to a disadvantage for Kizreyev, in my opinion. If he wants to win a fight, man, just take him down early or at least try to get him against the cage, slow him down because at the end of the day, Murdov is an explosive fighter. He does have some power um, as well as kids. Riev, I just think, you know, coming in here as your first for your first true test in the UFC, I think you just got to stick to your bread and butter right away. And if he does that, uh, I think he gives himself a good chance to win this fight. Yeah, this is uh, one where an undefeated daggy at minus 180 looks very tempting. And uh, the two years off, because the last time we saw Kizriev was his debut, and that was March of 2022, so it's almost two years off. He's had one cancel bout in between then. Uh, that was last year, September 23rd. He was scheduled to fight Malkoon, pulled out, and now he's getting a fight here. I don't know. I mean, I think Muradov is going to be the better striker. But I think Kizriev knows to win this fight, get the takedowns, and do your work there. And I, I know, I, I would assume that he knows Muradov is dangerous. He has good power on the feet. I think he just tries to avoid those shots, get close to him, pick a leg, throw him up against the cage, get him down, and do his work there. I just don't think he's going to go in there. Like last time against Tululin, Tululin took that fight on short notice. I think that was Tululin's debut, too. And he's probably like, all right, let me mess around with this guy a little bit on the feet. Let me see how it works out. And it was, uh, he won the first round and then goes out there and submits him in the second round. I think he comes in here knowing that Muradov is a better opponent and just goes to the takedowns right away. Um, you know, he, he doesn't have terrible uh, offensive game on the feet. Kizarev doesn't. He's solid kicks, solid hands. Uh, and we've seen a lot of the, the Dagestani fighters over the years, just a lot more complete fighters. With the time off, I think he gets even better, and uh, I'll take Kizriev for the pick. I think Murdov's going to be a popular underdog pick here, knowing that uh, Kizriev, nobody really knows who he is. Like He's had one fight in the UFC, uh, and I, a lot of people know who Murdov is right? because uh, we've seen him multiple times, and I think Kizriev gets this one done. Minus 180 is not terrible, um, but, you know, you know, you don't, you never really know with the time off, like what they've been doing. I would assume being a Dagestani, you're probably in the gym all the time. And I honestly see, I see him all the time cornering people in the UFC too. So I'm like, <laughs> why is he not fighting? Like he's, he's, he's around the sport all the time. So like, why is he not fighting? But he'll be the pick for me. That's the one thing about like their wrestling style too. It's not like a shoot a double leg and then just he's in side control. Like, He'll trap the legs. You'll get him out. He'll try to work up. He'll he'll take you down again. Like it's such an exhausting, exhausting pace and wrestling style. Like it's I don't know. There's something different about it. Like against Tululin, it's like Tululin would get half up, and then he would expend a ton of energy trying to keep it there before Kitsriev would just take him straight back down again. Like that just drains guys. And he's gonna be at a little. Kitsriev is gonna be a little bit of a size disadvantage here, but he uses like it, it's like you can't really tell when he's in these fights. Like he uses his. Um, I don't even want to say size, but you know, he is a shorter guy. He gets in close. He's explosive. Um, and you know, if he can just get in close enough to get the takedowns, I just think he could really wear down Muradov here. He's just got to watch out early for the big right hand. I agree. We'll move on to the welterweight bout. Randy Brown coming in as the favorite against Muslim Salikov. Sitting at plus two hundo. This fight was supposed to happen. UFC 296 gets canceled and it's rescheduled for a fight at the Apex, just what they probably wanted to move from uh, the T-Mobile back to the Apex. Smaller case for Randy Brown, that got to take that into consideration because uh, he's a guy that likes to stay to the outside, pump the jab, move around, and use his length. You see the frame there, six foot three. He's going to have an eight-inch reach advantage. I think he gets it done as the favorite. I think he does. And, you know, Solikov's got some really sick, slick striking. Um, 
you know, I, I like that style. It's fun. It's a little change up from, you know, uh, any other fighters whose names end at an OV. It's like you don't really expect this Russian fighter to come in here um, and throw these spinning kicks and stuff like that, but it is fun to watch. However, he's just a tad older now. And when you fight a guy like Randy Brown, um, who is good, he's got good volume, he's going to hit you uh, to the body quite a bit. He's very, very long. He's hard to reach at times if he fights from the outside. And the one thing that really jumps off the page to me when I look at Solikov's recent run in the UFC, he loses a Dolby. He's extremely gassed later in that fight, like just so tired. Um, surprised that Dolby couldn't put him out. Beats Andre Fialo by KO, who everybody has beat Fialo by KO now. It's like four or five in a row KO losses for him. Gets knocked out by Lee Jingliang. And then his two wins before that is Francisco Trinaldo, who was like 43 at the time, and uh, Zaleski Dos Santos, who is a stud, but also, you know, damn near 40 years old too. He just doesn't have that big win um, that makes me think he's going to come in here and be able to beat Randy Brown in a striking fight. You know, Randy Brown has the loss to, you know, Jack, or uh, yeah, Jack Della Maddalena, which, you know, in hindsight, is not a bad loss at all. I mean, that guy is a stud. He's, uh, fighting extremely well right now and then he's got a ton of wins right behind that so yeah i, I just think the size difference and the reach is going to make it hard for solikov to really be effective with his style of striking and i think randy brown is going to be able to hit him at ease and this fight will probably go a little bit longer and once it does i think solikov slows down significantly and randy brown can maybe even get that late finish yeah, I mean, we've broke down this fight before and and the one thing that i always come back to is like randy brown just makes fights close for no reason and and when you're True. betting minus 240 it's like it's nerve-wracking because he doesn't throw a lot of very like powerful shots like he'll throw up a good amount of volume he lands a lot of jabs stays to the outside good good footwork uh uses his kicks pretty well too uh, the teep kick he'll do he'll throw some leg kicks but those legs are pretty damn skinny so you never really know if that thing's gonna snap or not Salikov, on the flip side, not very high volume, and most of his strikes are, are pretty powerful. So it's a pretty clear clash of styles. And uh, in this one, it's, it's probably not one that I'll get super invested in because I think Randy Brown wins the fight, but I don't really feel confident at minus 240 that he wins it you know, decisively with the way that he's been winning fights. Like Wellington Terman, 29-28, but the third round he looked terrible. Uh, Francisco Trinaldo, he won. But that was a close fight for no reason. Chaos Williams, same thing. Uh, and it was just, just a lot of these fights where I'm like, you could be winning these 30-27, but for, for some reason you take a round off or a round that you should have won. It gets way too close, and I don't necessarily like him at the chalk here. Salikov being 39, I, I don't like that either. And Granted, his losses are to Dalby, who we've seen be an absolute beast. Uh, and Li Jingliang, who is a, a very solid opponent. So, I don't know. For betting-wise, I wouldn't bet on Randy Brown. I'd maybe chalk it up to a dog or pass, but I do think Randy Brown wins, so he'll be the pick for me. Co-main event, Hanato Moicano. Money Moicano coming back as a minus 145. Favorite against Drew Dober, sitting at plus 150. 35 years of age for Drew Dober, 34 years of age for Renato Moicano. Both guys, a lot of fun to watch fight in the octagon. This should be a, a banger. I'm looking forward to it. It's a good co main event, especially for a, an Apex card. Who you got? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, there's a, I think there's only two ways this fight plays out it's Drew Dober by KO or, or Moicano by submission, if I'm being honest. Like, I don't think either of these guys are going to decision. I mean, look at Drew Dober. His last five fights have all ended by KO. Um, four of those, he's won. I mean, he's knocked out Terrence McKinney, Rafael Alves, Bobby Green, and Ricky Glenn. And then he gets chinned for the first time in the UFC to Matt Frivola, which, you know, Matt Frivola just lost to BSD. But regardless, he's got some of the heavier hands in the division in the whole entire UFC. Like, the guy has some serious power. I don't think that's Mo Moicano. Like, Moicano doesn't have a single knockout in the UFC, maybe even his career. Like he's just, you know, he's a, he's a grappling guy. He's got great submissions. I think his last four wins all do come by submission. Um, but you know, what concerns me here is he's been off for 450 something days. 
he he beats Brad Riddell by submission in the first round pretty early, and that was in November of 2022. So um, coming back to a guy like Drew Dober, like I don't know if that's the guy you want to come back if you have any kind of ring rust or anything. A guy who's going to push a ridiculous pace, a guy who's I mean he's kind of like a gnat, dude. You can try to hit him off you, but he's going to be right back in your face throwing shots. Um, I don't know if Moicano's really got the offensive wrestling to go in there and take Dober down to get him in the positions he wants. I mean, Dober doesn't have the highest takedown defense, but he's also fought a, a shitload of grapplers in his UFC career, like Islam Makachev's, the you know guys like that who are who are constantly looking to take you down. Um, so I think his wrestling is good enough. His jujitsu, he's definitely been submitted a few times in his career. But if he can just stuff the takedowns, I don't think Drew Dober is going to mess around with any of the clinch or anything like that. I think he's just going to stay in his face and and throw shots. Maybe put him up against the cage for a minute, but go back to teeing off on him. And, you know, uh, Moicano has been knocked out, I want to say, man, three times in the UFC so far against yeah. good opponents. But, you know, he has shown where he can be chinned. So if Dober can land some of those big shots like he did against Bobby Green or Ricky Glenn, um, you know, it's going to be a long night for, for Moicano, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, Giga Chad Dober. <laughs> I mean, you, you're not – we thought you could knock him out. Matt Favola proved uh, otherwise, but – I don't think Moicano's knocking him out because he yeah. doesn't have a single knockout in his career. Um, and we've seen his stand, Moicano's stand-up game progress over his career. Like I would say he has pretty solid stand-up at this point because uh, he's fought a lot of good competition, like Jose Aldo, uh, Korean Zombie, Calvin Cater, Brian Ortega, Rafael Fazeev. Like he's fought a lot of good competition, so he's good. He's had to improve every aspect of his game. Obviously. Now it, it's the strong suit of his game is still the submission ability. Um, and the wrestling is it's leaves a little bit to be uh, desired because with that great submission ability, if he had some really solid wrestling, like he'd be an absolute beast. Um, and in this one, it's like, I just think Drew Dober is going to be able to walk him down. Uh, he can eat those, those jabs or those one twos from Waikano and just keep coming forward rip some body kicks because it's going to be southpaw on orthodox and that body kick's going to be there drew dober's got great kickboxing uh great muay thai and i think that'll be uh the difference here i think drew dober's everything that he's lands is going to be more significant than moicano i don't think moicano's going to be able to to take him down and get a submission and on the flip side like we're talking moicano facing really good strikers drew dober's been in there with a lot of good grapplers and uh yeah. He's been submitted a good amount of times, but eventually, you know, that that proves to be a uh, learning lessons like submitted by Makachev, submitted by uh, Benil Daryush and OAM. So, I mean, those are three of the best in the world. And uh, Moicano, I think the path to victory for him is to get a submission. I think Drew Dober could win by knockout. I think he could win a decision because uh, if you look at the Moicano RDA fight, Moicano got his head boxed off like he was getting beat up everywhere and he survived for five rounds so maybe moicano can uh, make it to the scorecards if drew dober is putting it on him but then you look and see uh drew dober doesn't have a win by decision since 2018 so if he lands on you it's gonna hurt and uh, i think he will land i do think it will hurt i think uh, moicano will probably get knocked out so drew dober is gonna be my pick another dog picking a lot of dogs on this card so that, that's the thing like for moicano like you do look at his knockout losses it didn't take any of those guys that long or at least it didn't take them many significant strikes to get to the knockout fazeev first round through 21 significant strikes uh korean zombie 16 significant strikes i mean he just put him down with that right hand like very very fast jose aldo 26 significant strikes he had the ko it's like you put a guy like dober in there who throws some volume but everything's with power it's like all it takes is just one or two of those to land or even just clip them and get them wobbled if drew yeah. dober wobbles my Mo moicano i don't think the chances of moicano surviving the next sequence are high at all yeah. it's just it just seems like a matter of time in this fight for me i agree i agree i like drew dober this week that brings us to the main event roman delaidze coming in as a slight dog against nazardine and mavov sitting as the favorite uh pretty solid Main event here. I mean, they're not like two massive names, but they're two exciting fighters. Ibovov, 
flashy striker going to stay to the outside and has really shown a good offensive uh, wrestling game and a decent, pretty solid submission game as well. The leads a 35 years old. He went on that tear where he was just finishing everybody and cracked into the rankings with a win over Hermanson on short notice. Uh, and then he took a loss to Marvin Vittori last year in uh, March. It was a loss by decision and kind of a controversial one. Like he was, I had a win in round one. I thought round two was pretty close. I think Vittori won round three. I think it really comes down to round two. Uh, it was a, a unanimous decision loss for Delizze, which was crazy to me. Um, one of the judges gave him the 30, 27 to uh, Vittori, which was just absurd in my opinion. But I think Delizze very clearly could have won that fight. And uh, if he does, he'd be on a, a really solid five-fight win streak. A lot of those, almost all of them, coming in as underdogs. Like He was an underdog against Dawkins, underdog against Hawes, underdog against Hermanson, a big underdog against Vittori. He's coming in as an underdog again. Do you think he could pull it off once again? The thing is with him, like he's he's so dangerous. And he's like a, I mean, I think his grappling is so underrated and appreciated. You watch some of his fights. The grappling is absolutely insane. He almost looks like like Paul Craig in there or something like that. Even like the looks um, to where he can just pull these submissions or, or get in good positions like at the drop of a hat. Like he just pulls things from up his sleeve that uh, you didn't know guys could could do. I mean, I was at his fight against uh, Jack Hermanson and he's kind of getting boxed up a little bit. And then Jack Hermanson gets the takedown. But the scrambles, he had him in like a. I want to say it was like an arm bar and then a triangle and then into like yeah. a calf slicer. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how the hell, like how many calf slicers do you really see in the UFC? I mean, Jack Hermanson was stuck in that calf slicer, slicer phase down. There was nothing he could do about it. And so Roman Delidze got the TKO, but he would have got the submission if he would have just yeah. squeezed. Such um, a helpless position, dude. Oh like, man. Yeah. It's like, you You're can't move asking. your face down. Like <laughs> you, can't do, you literally can't do anything. Like I'd, I'd be, very curious to like act, ask someone who's like a Brazilian jiu jitsu black belt, like, how do you get out of that? Like, yeah, I don't even know how. Yeah, uh, especially you know, in like MMA where they can hit you in the face. So, right. Or, wow. or how do you even get somebody in it? Like, it's crazy that he was able to do that to a high level grappler like Jack Hermanson. Like, it just shows yeah. you his skills are just next level. And he's a strong guy. Um, striking wise, like, if you stand at distance with Imabob for the whole fight, like, he's going to lose, I think. And, you know, unless it goes way deep in the fight and Imovov gasses, but uh, Imovov's fast, he's technical, um, throws great combinations on the feet, decent volume as well. And Delidze, that's just not the type of striker he is. Like, he's more of a, a patient guy who's going to pick at the big shots. He's not going to, you know, jab you up and hit you with three to four shot combinations. Um, he, he just like a little slower than Imovov on the feet. But if Imovov doesn't, um, stick to the technical striking and, and starts throwing big shots. I mean, all it takes is one time for Delize to get his hands locked and take him down and get your back. Like if he gets uh, Imabov on the ground here, I think it's I think it's bad news. I think it's bad news for anybody that Delize would fight, yeah. which makes me nervous that he's got five rounds to kind of give himself a chance to get into that position. Imabov in a three round fight, I think this is him all day long. But it is five rounds. Delize has just kind of got that dog where he's going to be there uh, for five rounds, tired or not. And, and if Imovov makes a mistake, slips up and finds himself on the bottom, I think it's bad, bad news here. And, uh, you know, for the pick, I do think Imovov probably pulls it off. But, man, betting-wise, he's not going to be in any of my parlays or anything like that at all. Uh, Delize is just way too dangerous. Yeah, so it's such a scary thing if you're going to go to the ground with Delize. So if you're Imovov, bro, like – just stay to the outside. Yeah. I think you just, I think you cruise to a five round decision victory by just staying active from the outside kicks. Honestly, make it boring. Like just make this yeah. fight super boring and you win it. Uh, but Delize, if he gets you to the ground or even if you take him to the ground, like you're in big trouble. And it's not really like he doesn't really get a ton of credit when you think of like the best grapplers in like the UFC, but. The little times that we've seen him in the UFC, like the dude is dangerous. Like, I don't even know where he's coming up with a lot of this stuff. He gets put <laughs> on his back and he's like already got you in an arm bar. And then you're like trying to pull your arm out and then he switches to the, the leg 
and you're like, oh my God, I, my leg is about to get torn off. Uh, so Imovov, the thing that scares me about Imovov too is like he's been working his his wrestling a good amount in his last few fights. Like he took Chris Curtis down three times in uh, a round and a half, and then he took Buckley down twice. So if you're Imovov, I'm like, don't even try to take him down. Like yes. just stay to the outside. I think you win this fight pretty easily based on volume because Delize doesn't have much technical striking. Like it's right. kind of more of a brawling, a lot of overhands. And one thing that I noticed when I was watching his film is he always it doesn't matter who he's fighting. So if he like Vittori was a southpaw, Delize fought orthodox the entire time. And then you look at Hermanson fight. Hermanson's orthodox. Delize fought southpaw the entire mm -hmm. time. And then you look at Delize versus Phil Hawes. Phil Hawes, orthodox. Delize was southpaw the whole time. So he's always going to be, he'll switch his stances based on what you're in. Imovov's mostly a orthodox fighter, so I would expect Delize to come in southpaw. I don't think his left hand is as powerful as his right hand. Um, and I think that gives him uh, Imovov an advantage because if Delize hits you, you're going to feel it, especially with the right hand. Uh, so stay, stay the outside, use your kicks. Uh, he's very good at it. So that's why I think he gets this one done. And Imovov will be the pick for me. I think he stays the outside, use the kicks, kick the legs, kick the – maybe not kick the, the body too much unless you're very quick with it. You don't want to get your leg caught and then uh, you're on the ground. But even his hands are pretty fast. So I think he stays uh, to the outside, picks up a victory. But maybe maybe you like a Delize inside the distance if uh, – and the what is it called decision no bet yeah decision no bet that that would be a decent uh spot if the the line is good enough uh, a lot of books don't carry it but if you have a book that has it that's a pretty solid bet uh because i don't think the leads is winning the decision here he's just right. dangerous and i don't think he wins rounds so he involves the pick for me got anything else on the main event oh, just that that's it it's your typical striker versus grappler. And it, it's so weird that Delidze has basically like all KO wins and no submission wins in the <laughs> UFC, but it is just from his grappling, like getting into dominant positions. And, yeah. you know, Phil Haas, I mean, gets knocked out by everybody. Like Delidze isn't a technical striker. He's going to lose the boxing match nine out of 10 times, but he is heavy handed too. Like he can clip guys. I just don't know if Imavov is weak chinned enough to to be put out by one of his shots. And if it stays on the feet, it's all Imavov. If it goes to the ground, it's all Delidze. We'll yeah. see who slips up. Yeah, and uh, I will definitely take a look at the Delidze submission prop because yeah. he hasn't been getting submissions, but he kind of has. Like, most, <laughs> like the way he's winning the fight is because of his submission skills. Yeah, And uh, Imavov has only been finished once and he got submitted. That was in his first professional fight, so... Maybe that comes back to haunt him and he gets submitted here. But either way, even we're back. We just got cut out. But we're going to hit you with the little outro here. Those are the picks for UFC Vegas 85. If you want all the bets for the double leg or for UFC Vegas 85, join the double leg premium. Link is in the description for that. Follow us on the IG at the double leg. Get the free pick there on Saturday. Stay up to date with everything at HI Picks on the medias for me. Where can they find you? All social media is at the Parlay MMA. Looking forward to it. And stay tuned for the Best Bets show uh, towards the end of the week. We post that there, give you three free picks that we're all on. I uh, give you the, the best favorite, the best underdog, and uh, the best prop that we have on the card. So stay tuned to that. Sub hit the subscription button uh, on YouTube, and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Appreciate it. The double leg.